And so thanks very much to everybody for coming along during this lunchtime. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit today, uh, I was going to talk about electrophysiological and uh, behavioral markers of addiction because when Amanda asked me back in October, you know, full of uh, optimism uh, that I would have the EEG data ready for now, but of course uh, I don't, so I'm going to slightly change it to hemodynamic <laughs> and uh, behavioral markers of addiction. Uh, it's all electrical and yeah, I guess, at the, at the, the heart of it. So. Uh, yeah, so I'm mostly going to talk about MRI today, not uh, EEG at all. Uh, so my research is primarily concerned with the adolescent brain. Uh, it's just slightly off the screen there. Uh, and by adolescence, I mean up to the age of kind of like mid mid twenties, even like mid to, to kind of late twenties. Uh, and the adolescent brain is very interesting because it's in a period of change. So uh, you know, as human beings, we go from being dependent on our adults to being independent and through this transition period the brain is changing and the way it changes is by actually reducing the amount of gray matter uh, in the brain so the, the gray matter is pruned back so you have all these kind of uh, gardening metaphors that you're pruning back the unwanted gray matter and this makes the brain more efficient and then the fully mature brain has actually got quite quite a bit less gray matter than the than the child brain proportionally uh, the key thing here though is it doesn't happen uniformly so it tends to happen more or less posterior to anterior and kind of medial to lateral. So, uh, so some people have associated this with you know, a variety of uh, disorders that tend to arise in the course of adolescence. So, so things like ADHD tend to uh, start off kind of slightly earlier in development, but uh, substance use disorders and mood disorders and schizophrenia tend to take off during the adolescent years. So there's quite a lot of literature around you know, linking the, the adolescent brain and the changes in the adolescent brain to uh, impulse control disorders uh, or you know, substance use specifically. And most of them work off uh, these kind of hot-cold models. So there's a, there's a variety of different models, and it's a very nice review by uh, BJ Casey last year in the annual review of psychology where she kind of works through a few of these different models. But the basic idea is that there's a, a system that's, uh, that's subcortical, so it's kind of basal ganglia, uh, limbic system, that's a hot system. So that's, that's like uh, uh, William Shatner from, from Star Trek. So it's kind of, it's the Spock. Uh, and then Spock would be the cool system. So they've got prefrontal, top-down, cognitive control system that kind of imposes some order on this, this hot system. So it's a, it's a tension between the two, between the, the hot system, the go system, and then the prefrontal cognitive control system. And the basic idea is that in adolescence, the hot system is overdeveloped relative to the, the prefrontal cool system. So it takes a while for that prefrontal control to kick in. And that's why you see adolescents have kind of uh, issues around kind of risk taking and you know, starting to use misuse substances like alcohol and cannabis and nicotine and so on. And so there's a few different flavors of, it, of this, these, these models. So some of them kind of separate out the amygdala, for example, from the ventral stratum. So they separate out more emotional areas from pure reward processing areas, and then other models kind of postulate that it's, a, it's the non-linear tension between the, the underlying uh, hot system versus the, the cold system, but they all basically have the, the same idea. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah so, so a number of different uh, studies have shown the differences between adults and adolescents on these kind of hot versus cold systems. So one that I get an opportunity to wheel out here is one that Louise and I did uh, many, many years ago uh, you can't really, for some reason the screen is kind of slightly chopped off at the side. Uh, but basically, it's a delayed discounting task, so people tend to discount future money uh, more than, than current money. So you, you'd probably take a tenner now versus a uh, you know, 12 euro in a year's time. And it turns out that adolescents do this particularly uh, more robustly than adults, that they tend to delay or discount the value of future rewards much more so than adults. And Neuroimaging studies have actually tracked this uh, so, well, in a cross-sectional study that they've given people uh, a delayed discounting task and they've watched the interactions between the prefrontal system and the reward system uh, and they've shown that over time these two areas kind of tend to talk to each other a bit more as people, as people get older while they do a delayed discounting task. So you're kind of uh, targeting this, these two systems and then you can actually watch it mature over time. So they talk about when these two systems are talking to each other efficiently that you've got mature uh, supervised cognition. So it's good evidence that there is kind of top-down control uh, over these reward areas and that's one of the important things about adolescent development and risk-taking and uh, novelty-seeking and so on. Uh, 
Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, addiction in the context of, of brain imaging and uh, brain imaging and maybe even psychology in general is kind of going through, if not quite a crisis, then kind of a re-evaluation of the methods that we use. So, so in imaging, one of the problems is that the brain is really, really complex. So we typically deal with like 50,000 voxels uh, per image. And that's just if you're looking at a standard kind of contrast. So if you start to think about connectomics and looking at how different areas of the brain connect to each other, the, the problem is an order of magnitude greater. Uh, obviously, you've got the brain, but you've also got other influences like genetics. So we all have like, you know, tens of thousands of genetic influences on our behavior, other things like demographics, life experience, and so on. Uh, you know, things that have happened to you in your life, adversity, and so on. Uh, and this makes for a very complex uh, set of data that's very difficult uh, to interrogate. And particularly when it comes to neuroscience, it's been shown that actually the, the typical effect size in neuroscience is quite small, and nearly all, 80% of neuro, neuroimaging studies to date have probably been underpowered and probably uh, false positives. So there's been some kind of uh, more general uh, addressing of this issue in the, in the scientific literature, particularly in psychology. Uh, and I think the, the American Statistical Association have had a, a position paper out on p-values now. So there's this kind of sense that, you know, that we need to re-evaluate uh, our sample sizes, particularly in neuroimaging and the ways that we interrogate the data. So kind of my, my solution to this is to use a big data approach. So I tend to use big data sets uh, as big as I can get my hands on, and then use other methods from uh, computer science. So I don't really use p-values anymore. So I find that there that uh, that other methods developed within other disciplines that have dealt with these problems for a long time uh, are actually better than the, the kind of traditional stats that we that we usually use. So broadly speaking, the kind of framework that that a lot of my work is in is is in this area of so-called population neuroscience. So these are kind of big studies big neuroimaging studies. So there's, a, there's only really a handful of them out there now. So there's, uh, there's a big one by the, the NIH. Uh, they've got a couple of studies. There's one in Canada called the Saguenay Youth Study that's got about a thousand people. And then the one I work in that I'll talk more about, uh, the so-called Imogen Study. So this has got, started off with about two and a half thousand kids. Uh, it's longitudinal, so it's gonna go on for about, uh, it'll be 10 years in total. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So the funding for that just came through in the last uh, week or so. So the basic idea of this population neuroscience approach is that you take a lot of people, you know, uh, much, much order, much, much bigger, orders of magnitude bigger than the typical neuroimaging study, and you get a lot of information on them. So you get a lot of information on their environment, uh, their diet, their social environment, their family, uh, their circumstances, you know, uh, if they've used drugs, if their parents have used drugs, uh, all these kind of influences from that perspective, then you also try and get information on the genotype as well, so on the genes. So in Imogen, for example, all the kids have had like a, a blood taken, or as many as consented, so nearly all of them have had blood taken and they've got a full genetic workup, both of their parents as well, where they could both be found, which is most of the time. Uh, they've also got a full blood workup as well. Uh, in terms of genetics, and then we have lots of information on the kind of family history, so whether the, the mother self-reported smoking in pregnancy or self-reported alcohol use in pregnancy and so on. So the idea is to get all these measures, environmental and genetic, and then look at cognitive neuroscience uh, outcomes. So this is the, the discipline of, of population neuroscience. So it's kind of like a cross between epidemiology and, and neuroimaging, really. And the one that I'm involved in is the Imogen study, which is, is going back a while now, so it's actually an FP6 funded project, and there were eight sites. There were there was one in Dublin, two in the UK, one in France, and four in Germany, uh, and this recruited about 2,500 14-year-olds in, uh, and they came in into the institutes, uh, and they did several hours of psychometric testing, so they did lots of cognitive testing, full IQ, full WISC, uh, personality testing, they got their blood taken, uh, they also did a lot of online uh, metrics as well, so they did loads of cognitive tests online, personality tests online. They came in, they did two hours of scanning, so I'll talk about some of the scans that were done. They had a full kind of DSM workup as well. Uh, and then they were also followed up as well, I'll talk a bit about that too. So they're actually going to be followed up until about the age of 23, 24 now. Uh, so, so it's this huge big study. 
They've lots and lots of phenotypic data on them, so loads of drug use data, so they filled out loads of drug use questionnaires, uh, and the, the genotyping data and the neuroimaging data as well. Uh, so the idea in this study was to kind of target the systems that are particularly important for adolescents. And I should say 14 is a good age to get these kids in because you know half of them have, have tried uh, drinking alcohol and half of them haven't. So 14 is kind of the age in which you know, you're kind of on the tipping point of people trying stuff versus not trying stuff. So it's a good split in terms of finding people who are clean versus people who've actually done, done quite a bit uh, by the age of 14. So in terms of the tasks, there was three main tasks to use. So the idea was to target the social brain, and this used the, the faces task. So basically they saw angry faces versus neutral faces. So you're trying to target systems like the, the limbic system, the emotional system, the amygdala, uh, specifically tends to light up. Uh, targeting the inhibitory control system. So this is the ability to inhibit a motor response once you've started it, and it's been shown that it's you know, highly relevant in ADHD, Adult cocaine addicts, adult heroin addicts, and so on tend to do poorly on this task. And then there's also uh, an assay of the reward system using the monetary incentive delay, uh, which basically, the clever thing about that, actually I have some slides on the next page, is you can separate uh, anticipation uh, from outcome. So if this is the, the social task, basically we had these kind of video vignettes of people making faces, and you know, they've been rated to be ambiguous, versus other ones that have been rated uh, to be angry. So you kind of, the key contrast that we're interested in primarily is this kind of angry versus ambiguous uh, responding. There's also kind of a high level of visual control. Then there's this monetary incentive today task developed by Brian Knudsen in Stanford. And as I said, the key thing about this is you can separate reward anticipation from reward outcomes. So, so people tend to respond uh, differently to anticipation versus outcome. There's even a kind of a male-female difference there. Uh, so the basic idea is you can kind of see how they, they feel about uh, you know, expecting a large reward versus expecting a small reward versus not, not expecting uh, a reward at all. And they're actually only working for M&Ms in this task. So, so Japong is working on kind of analyzing these data and mapping out the reward system. It works really, really well. Like, the, the T values are like 40 or something like that for the, for the reward system. But they're all just working for M&Ms, like two M&Ms for every 10 points or something like that. And even the French side weren't even allowed to give M&Ms. So, so, but it's still, it's amazing. They still light up. The reward system is really clear uh, in this task. And then there's the, the stop signal delay task. So basically you've got a press to the left or to the right. And then every so often those left and right arrows will change in the, midstream to upwards arrows, you've got to inhibit. So the idea is that you, you started to make a response and then you see some signal uh, that tells you to stop and you've got to, you've got to pull back from that. Uh, and it's rigged in the sense that as you get better, the task gets harder, so you try to get like 50% success versus fail. So it's a really nice task when it works uh, in terms of separating uh, you know, inhibitory control and, and success and failures. So, uh, so I'll just run through a few papers that have kind of come out uh, in the last year, using the imaging data set that I've been involved with. Okay, this one I'm pretty tangentially uh, involved with. I'm st somewhere in the middle of the squint. I'm sure you can't see it. Uh, one there somewhere though. So it's actually from Hugh Garvin's lab in, in Vermont. And uh, uh, Hugh was an undergrad here at UCD, psychology actually. Uh, so what they did was they looked at cannabis users. So, so you know, cannabis use isn't really that prevalent in 14 year olds, but when you've got two and a half thousand kids, you can find about a hundred of them who are, who are smoking joints fairly regularly. So when you boil that down, they were able to find 70 uh, reasonably heavy, heavy for 14 year old cannabis users, and then match them with 70 controls. Uh, and then you could look at the amygdala, which is the, the area that, of the brain that's associated with fear, maybe emotion in general, while they look at these angry faces versus the neutral faces. And what they found is that the, the cannabis users, the current cannabis users, have these hypersensitive uh, evaluations of the, of the angry faces. So their amygdala reaction is, is significantly higher than that of the match control. So, so again, you can't really see it uh, off to the side there, but, but there seems to be something different. So obviously we can't disentangle cause and effect here because you don't know if you know, the guys who like to seek out cannabis are the same ones who have this kind of aberrant uh, emotional processing. But it's certainly possible that, it, that it's some kind of consequence of 
of heavy cannabis use at age 14 is that you're kind of changing your brain somehow. Uh, and we know this from, from animal studies that, that cannabis tends to have these neurotoxic effects. Uh, and it's kind of relevant in the sense that uh, a lot of places now are starting to legalize cannabis or relatively more places are legalizing cannabis. So it's just been legalized in a couple of states in the US. So there's like ma massive focus there uh, on cannabis use. So you can't use it until the age of 18 or sorry, 21 in, in the United States, but other places like Uruguay, you can use it from the, from the age of 18. So just given what we know about the way that the, the teenage brain is developing, and 18 is like, you know, right in the middle of adolescence brain-wise, uh, you know, it kind of begs the question as to you know, whether that's a good idea to let people start using cannabis or, or make it legal at the age of 18 anyway versus 21. So it seems like there might be some kind of consequential effect there. Uh, here's a, another paper that just came out last week by one of my... Uh, PhD students here in UCD, uh, Lee Jollins, and Japan was on as well, and Kira too, where we looked at the, the monetary incentive delay task, so this is this reward processing task, and instead of doing the kind of standard analysis where you kind of look at what blobs light up, uh, you know, when you compare like big reward versus no reward, we did what's called a PPI analysis uh, with Kira's help. So what this means, in essence, is that you're looking at the connectivity, so it's a psychological physiological interaction. So you want to see the connectivity of, of particular regions and what they connect to as a function of the different uh, contrasts. So, so what we did is we seeded the ventrostratum, which is known to be the most active area in this task for reward anticipation. And then basically what we said is what areas what are differentially you know, active with this uh, ventrostratum area across you know, expecting a, a big reward versus expecting no reward. And so we were able to map that. So some people are going to have different reactions. They're going to like have more connectivity when they, when they expect a big reward uh, versus other people who won't. And then we were able to, to break down the sample uh, into you know, how much they smoke. So again, there's not really that much heavy smoking going on in 14 year olds. But when you've got uh, two and a half thousand of them, we were able to find 206 who had at least, you know, a decent decent amount, like a fair amount of smoking, you know, ranging from the fairly light smokers who'd only done it like three or five times in their lifetime to, to a, reason, a fairly sizable group, you can't see it because it's off the screen, uh, of about 60 participants, you know, who'd smoke pretty daily, regular smokers. They'd smoked at least uh, 40 occasions in their lifetime, so they're pretty much daily smokers. So then we can map up the, the connectivity that correlates with the amount of smoking uh, that people were doing. So there's, there's quite a lot to the process there. So if I just kind of pick out uh, some of the slides or some of the images uh, to, to highlight. So this is the, the left ventral stratum, which doesn't seem to be, you know, as differentially related to, uh, you know, to the different conditions, the big reward versus no reward. And actually, this is something that, that quite a few studies have found. It's, it's not unique to us. Uh, so, you know, broadly speaking, it seems that that there's some like less connectivity for those who are heavier smokers to, to prefrontal control areas like the, the right IFG there, uh, the orbitalis part. Uh, and we kind of, we see that pretty much as well when we look at the right ventral stratum, which seems to be more active during this task. That just seems to be broadly speaking that less, like, less connectivity to the prefrontal areas for those who are heavier smokers uh, and more connectivity to, to say the amygdala or the thalamus. So these kind of subcortical reward emotional areas uh, for those who are heavier smokers. So it does seem that there's some kind of difference there in terms of uh, subcortical versus uh, cortical or hot versus cold system uh, in smokers. And then also previously we looked at the uh, at the stop signal task, so we were able to show that there's kind of disassociable networks or dissociable networks in the stop signal task, and that then these could be differentially related to the amount of substance misuse uh, that people did. So for example, we were able to show that the, the orbital frontal cortex here, in terms of its activation during the stop signal task, basically could show uh, you know, whether people uh, would try substances or not, whether they try alcohol or cannabis uh, or nicotine. And then other areas, like the right IFG here, seem to be differentially associated with cannabis use. So the kind of, you know, it's, it's indicative of whether people are currently using cannabis or not. Uh, and again, it actually seems to scale with the amount of cannabis use that they use. So the more cannabis 
you use, the, the more you have to engage this system in order to, uh, to make a correct response in the stop signal task. So this does kind of suggest a, a dose response relationship as well. So that the more, basically the more cannabis you smoke, the, the harder it is for you to, or the, the harder your brain has to work uh, to do this stop signal task. So again, we don't know cause and effect, but it, you know, seeing this dose effect relationship does suggest that the cannabis is altering the brain uh, in some way. And sorry, and the one bit of uh, data that I will actually present from the lab we collected here. Uh, so basically, I cobbled together or amalgamated various different final year projects, uh, and we uh, we asked people, you know, how much, you know, how often have you been drunk in your lifetime? Uh, and it turns out that when you do a, a Spearman's correlation, that that it positively correlates with the amount of delayed discounting that you do. So the more likely you are to devalue money in the future, so it's worth less to you in the future, the more likely you are to have to have drunk or to have been drunk more times in your lifetime. So these are these are kind of college age students here. Uh, and then it's inversely associated with your stop signal reaction time, which is the main measure of uh, the main outcome from the stop signal task. So it's basically a measure of how good you are at inhibiting. So so the guys who drink more uh, kind of college age drinkers are less good at inhibiting on the stop signal task, behaviorally at least. So that's just a reaction time measure. So so you're you're worse at discounting and you're so you're more likely to discount and you're worse at the stop signal task. And it also correlates quite highly or quite significantly anyway uh, with the Barrett impulsivity scale, which is a personality measure of of impulsivity. So it does seem that there's definitely some kind of validity there to this uh, this idea of the, the, the sociable systems in uh, adolescence. And just finally, just to say there's another paper that came out last week uh, from Imogen that it's not all that it's not all bad news that we can look at you know areas that are affected by substance misuse, but there are also you know there's a, an increasing focus on resilience now. So people who have had adverse circumstances in their lives but yet seem to do okay. Uh, so what we did in this uh, study, and don't ask me any details about it because I did it about four years ago, it only came out last week, uh, but basically we could make four groups of, of people. So those who you know, uh, were competent, so they, were, they performed quite well on, on kind of assays of social functioning and how well they're coping with daily life. Uh, so we, we could split those into two groups, so those who are competent versus not competent. And then we also had life history on these people, so you can ask them, you know, have your parents separated? Have you have you had trouble in school? You know, have you moved? And trouble with friends or interaction with, with the law? Uh, so these kind of adversive uh, outcomes. So we could we could look at people who who had experienced adversity in their life up to the age of fourteen versus those who hadn't experienced adversity, and then we could kind of cross those two groups. So you can find people who you know are competent despite the fact that they've had you know a more adverse upbringing. So these are kind of capital C, capital A groups. And what we found is that we could relate these to uh, different, uh, so basically more prefrontal cortex, so greater gray matter density in the prefrontal cortex for those people who are both competent and who have uh, suffered adversity. So there seems to be something there that, that kind of separates these people out. They can actually thrive despite the fact that they've had uh, adverse uh, circumstances. And this wasn't like just a one pass, we basically changed around the variables or operationalized them in, in different ways, looked at different subgroups, took out a bunch of uh, covariates, and, and this pattern still seems to be there. Through like many, many analyses, it still seems to be there. And then we also pulled out a composite binge drinking score and correlated it with the gray matter volume from, uh, from these areas that distinguish these competent, adversive uh, people who can deal with adversity. And there's a negative correlation. So so basically, the more gray matter you, you have there, the less likely you are to engage in uh, you know, ultimately uh, behaviors that have negative outcomes like binge drinking. So there does seem to be some validity there that you can actually identify adolescent resilience uh, using brain imaging. And it correlates with meaningful metrics. So all of those studies to date were uh, cross-sectional and they all suffer from this problem of cause and effect. So really the, the holy grail in this, this area is to try and identify early risk and resilience factors for substance misuse because we know that if you can detect someone who is going to initiate alcohol use early uh, or 
cannabis use or nicotine use early, that if you can prevent them from, from doing so, even by, by six months at a time, you can dramatically reduce the chances of developing an alcohol addiction or a cannabis addiction uh, as an adult. So the, the key here is to try and find these factors of that uh, differentiate those who initiate early versus those who don't. Uh, so we, we know from the animal literature that, uh, because we can get a cause and effect in the animal literature, that adolescent rats exposed to, to high levels of alcohol as adolescents are impaired in terms of their learning all the way through adulthood, even if they, they just have the alcohol as adolescents and, and don't anymore. Uh, so they seem to be, some permanent damage seems to be done there. We know that, uh, again, rats who are, who are given nicotine as adolescent rats uh, tend to, you know, when they're given the opportunity as adults, they, they're much, much more likely to self-administer high doses and uh, you know, administer more times uh, nicotine as well. Uh, so, so that's something that, that we obviously can't show with, with humans, but we know it from the animal literature. And then in terms of cannabis, there's a, a very nice study in PNAS from a couple of years ago, basically showing that the people who were exposed, or people who took more cannabis over the course of 40 years, uh, knocked about eight IQ points uh, off themselves. And this seems to be, you know, this was a huge sample of like 10,000 people. They could follow them. They had lots of controls. They followed them from, the, from a very young age. So they could actually, you know, see, see this relationship proportional to the amount of cannabis that, that you use. And the kind of worrying thing is that even, say, if people stopped using cannabis in their mid-20s, they still held on to that uh, IQ decline. So it would be very advantageous to, to identify these risk factors uh, beforehand. Uh, so, so one of the uh, issues with this is that prediction is really difficult and it hasn't been handled very well uh, in the neuroimaging literature. And it's not something that's been, that's been recognized until quite recently, until the last year or two, that, that most of these prediction studies uh, have actually not worked out very well. Uh, so as I mentioned, so animal studies are okay to, to a certain point because you know, the, the difference is humans have this big prefrontal cortex that really makes us quite different from animals. You can't really say anything about voluntary initiation in, in a rat. They just tend to get administered nicotine or alcohol, and that's it. And then solving this issue of uh, cause and effect uh, is something that, that's very difficult to do. And you really, you need a longitudinal study with uh, a large number of participants who are not doing anything at baseline. So you can look at the, uh, so you can look at their brain. Problem is, if you if you look cross sectionally, you know, at, at these cannabis users and adolescents, you don't know if you're looking at the effects of, of taking lots of cannabis as an adolescent uh, versus some maybe some pre existing factors. Uh, so, so there's there's kind of the practical problems with doing these prediction studies, and you need a lot of, of uh, data. There's also issues in terms of the implementation, and it's kind of slightly counterintuitive. So I won't really go on about uh, too many of the details here, but in essence, if you want to do these, these predictions of a logistic regression or, or predicting individual outcome, your results get better the fewer subjects you have and, and the more uh, parameters that you look at. So it's kind of slightly counterintuitive that, that, uh, that the fewer subjects you have, the better your prediction looks. The problem is when you go and try and predict to a new participant, a new person who walks in the door, you can't do that very well. So you tend to overfit your sample. And this is what most uh, studies have done. So neuroimaging studies are characterized by having lots and lots of data. And it's really expensive, so you tend not to have a lot of subjects. Uh, so, so a couple of years ago, Hugh and I, Hugh Garvin and I did a review where we looked at all these kind of attempts to predict outcomes in the neuroimaging literature. Uh, and we were able to show that, that if you just, you know, go into MATLAB and just simulate some data, some random data, take some random data, you could basically get the same outcomes as, as most of these studies. So they, you know, they looked as if they were predicting, but they weren't really, they were, they were more or less just all operating at chance. Very few, very few weren't. Some of the Alzheimer's literature weren't, but most of the substance misuse studies were basically reporting chance performance as if it was, was real performance. So you've got to be careful, you've got to do like lots of controls to to check that what you're seeing is actually real. And the key test here, the, the, the acid test, is always how well does your model do on a new subject. So you've got to train up your model and then you've got to get a new subject into the door and see how well you classify on that new subject. So, 
so what you end up with is, is, a, is a large data set with lots of, kind of neuroimaging variables and lots of phenotypic variables. And probably 50% of my time is, is spent worrying about how to interrogate these data. So the methods are only developed up to a certain point. So, so a lot of my research is really concerned around methods and trying to actually interrogate these big data sets. So the first challenge is just not to get swamped by it. So there's, there's tons of it. So there's 50,000 voxels per brain scan. They've done a few different tasks and they have you know, structural data as well. Then you know, 600,000 genetic uh, SNPs as well. So it's important to try and find a way to, to interrogate those. And the traditional stats that we have don't really do it. Uh, so this is a, a, an image when I first tried to look at the stop signal task. Uh, and this is uh, Bonferroni corrected, you know, to, to whatever ten to the minus, uh, whatever it is, ten to the minus ten, and like there's still a bunch of areas significant. Like you just can't tell what what should you really be looking at uh, versus like what's kind of trivial and just it's not it's not really that important. So the kind of traditional p values don't work very well when you move into to the realm of big data. At the same time, in that 2012. Nature Neuroscience paper, what we did was we did a factor analysis, we did a, a data reduction on, on the stop signal task. And it's kind of, it was, it was all right at the time because that's how we coped with it. But, you know, in retrospect, it turns out we threw away a lot of data. So we spent like, you know, 10 million euro acquiring two and a half thousand scans and all these kids. And then you just do some uh, factor analysis and get rid of most of the variability and, 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 the, and you know, the actual signal uh, in your data, you kind of compress it down. So what you don't want to do is to start throwing away lots of data you just spent a fortune collecting. So, so more or less by chance, I came across uh, the machine learning literature, which is which is kind of topical. It's kind of coming into neuroimaging more and more. Uh, and this is most of these methods have been developed in in computer science, where they do deal with with lots of data. So they do have big data. They're dealing with the internet and web pages and web searches and so on. So a lot of the methods that they have are actually perfect for interrogating your imaging data with the, with the idea of trying to predict some outcomes. So you know, Google are trying to predict what's a good page when you, when you do a particular search. Uh, and in the same way, we're trying to figure out what's a good brain region when you're trying to predict future substance misuse. Uh, so basically, most of the methods I use now are, are machine learning methods. So the general strategy, so I'm going to fly through this bit, but uh, just to give you kind of an overview. So what we found is that the best way to interrogate these data are to have a number of different layers or, or filters uh, searching through the data. So what you do is you, you take all the data and, and you search through it and you get rid of most of it. And then you kind of uh, look at it again uh, with what's left and try and figure out what's the best of that. So maybe this is better explained by the, the subsequent slides. Uh, so what we do is, if we've got all these data, imagine these are like 50,000 voxels each, we do what's called feature selection. So it's, you basically take each voxel on its own and you pass it through a filter. So you say, how predictive is this voxel of, of the outcome? So it's not, it's not going to be very predictive, but what you do is you search through it and you get rid of all the ones that are basically uh, there by chance. And this gives you a subset of voxels or brain regions or, or SNPs if you're dealing with genetic data that have some kind of predictive validity. So that's kind of step one. And then step two is to use this, uh, this is a, this is a whole class of methods that are called you know, regularized regression or penalized regression. And the one that I like and I use is this thing called the elastic net. So what it does is it just puts a, a penalty on the size of the beta weights in a regression. And in effect, what this means is that it, it selects or it rejects groups of variables uh, to be included in the analysis. So, it, it, so you know, brain data are highly correlated, genetic data are highly correlated. So you don't want to, you know, to take one, one brain region and not take its neighbor and the same with, with a genetic effect as well. So what this can do is it can actually pull out groups of uninformative variables and then it keeps in other groups of informative variables. So it does these things in groups. So basically it, it clumps together groups of informative uh, data points. So it, it tends to work very well uh, with, with brain data. It's been used a reasonable amount with genetic data, but, but it seems to work quite well. 
So this is uh, this further reduces down the data set into groups of correlated variables that are that are informative. And then when we've got those, the the, the really important thing is to is to validate the model. Uh, so what you could do is you could uh, you you know you could take your data and chop it in half, and then you could train the model on one half of the data and then test to see if it works on on your leftover half. But that's really that's kind of wasteful. Because obviously you've got to double your sample size to do that, uh, so it's not very efficient. Uh, so there's a kind of a compromise to this, where you can use all of your data and still test on new subjects, and that's called cross-validation. Uh, so what you do is you, you take all your data, you chop it up into ten bins, say, you train the model on the first nine bins, and then you test it on the leftover tenth. And then the trick is it's just to move everything along by one bin, and then you train on the next nine out of ten, and then train on the, the final held over 10 sets. So you're making 10 models and you're testing 10 models, but the upshot is that you have now got a prediction for a brand new subject, uh, for every single subject in your data set, you haven't wasted any, so it's very efficient. And it, this is bread and butter to, uh, to computer scientists, but we tend not to do it a lot in psychology, mainly because we don't have the sample sizes where it's kind of, it's workable. Uh, and if you're really, really lucky, uh, you can develop a model and then apply it to a brand new sample uh, that, that's totally external. You know, so, so you might be able to find another sample somewhere that, that's reasonably similar with some of the same measures that you can then test your model. Uh, and there was a paper out in Nature Communications yesterday where they did this with uh, uh, autism. So basically these Japanese researchers trained a model uh, on their Japanese data uh, and they thought they could identify the brain regions that could predict whether someone was, was autistic or not, and then they applied it to a couple of other samples in the in the US, and I think another Japanese sample, and actually it held up. There was very few regions that were different, and it wasn't wasn't highly accurate, but it held up in a couple of different, completely different samples. That's kind of one of the first times I've ever seen uh, that in the literature. And then then there's other methods that I, that I won't really mention. There are kind of tricks from computer science to to make your solution more stable. So things like Ensemble methods or bagging, where you run you run the model hundreds and hundreds of times, and you kind of aggregate over it with slightly different uh, permutations of the sample. Uh, so there's loads of those out there. So the kind of first attempt to do this on on the imaging data we did with alcohol. So I'll present some new nicotine results in in a minute. So we tried this with alcohol before. Uh, so we could take again in imaging, uh, everything is imaging. Uh, so so those who had at least three lifetime been drinking occasions by the age of 14 versus 150 who hadn't uh, done any. And we knew that they would be clean for another couple of years as well. So these were kids who really weren't engaging in binge drinking. Uh, and this is a, a receiver operated curve. And the main thing is that that diagonal line is chance. Anything north northwest of that is, is, uh, is accurate classification. So you can actually do a, a pretty good uh, classification uh, on t in terms of who was a binge drinker versus who wasn't uh, using lots and lots of different variables from Imogen. And actually if you break it down into the, the subsets of where those variables came from, uh, so if 0.5 is chance, so using brain alone <coughs> is like slightly better than chance, it's like 0.57, so it's not, it's not random but it's not, not uh, great either. Better predictors were things like personality, so, so just novelty seeking and, and Again, we see this actually in, in some of the undergrad data I've collected here, is that these personality measures tend to be a lot better than the, kind of the, 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 the uh, cognitive measures or the physiological measures that we get as well. And history as well, so if, if people are uh, kind of experimenting uh, sexually, or even if they just have a boyfriend or a girlfriend, is actually a big predictor of whether they're engaging in things like uh, binge drinking as well. So brain doesn't do terribly well in this classification. But then the nice thing about Imogen is that uh, uh, two years after they did this based on assessment, someone called them up and they did uh, an interview over the phone. They did lots more online assessments and they could track what substance misuse they've done in the, in, in the intervening two years. So we had age 16 data uh, on these kids and actually the, the sample has been reacquired at the age of 18. So, so that was quite a while ago. So that the kids, so a thousand of them have come back into the scanner that's just finished up now, so there's been a thousand back to the scanner, and just last week there was funding to get them again at age 
uh, 24. So Imogen is going to be repeated again uh, at 80 24, which would be quite good because, you know, in terms of we, we can see people who've developed like, you know, actual chronic uh, addiction at this point. So we have the, the follow up data. So we know what happened to them two years after the baseline scan. So we could take a bunch of participants, none of whom had done any drinking uh, at the time that the imaging data were acquired. Uh, 150 of those stayed at the, the baseline level, but then other ones, 121 of those, went on in the future to go on and binge drink by the time that they got to age 16. So what we could do was, tr was try to predict, and we could actually kind of slide reasonably well. So if, if chance is 0.5, then we could get kind of halfway to, to a, an accurate prediction by using the data from Imogen in terms of trying to predict who is going to be a, a binge drinker. So an AUC of uh, 0.75, that's just a different way of showing it. And this time, brain actually did relatively better. Uh, so if, this, if the y-axis just it's slightly changed here, it's, it's a lot smaller than it was before. Uh, so now brain is actually reasonably comparable to personality. So, so it actually, the, the utility of brain is increased when it comes to doing these predictions. So personality is not so predictive. Uh, it's about as predictive as brain. And then life history as well. Yeah, so, so the basic idea was that uh, was that brain was relatively good compared to the other measures for uh, doing that kind of prediction. Uh, and then the next step was to roll it out to nicotine, uh, which I have. Which, any questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, you might not like this particularly, but given that we're looking at all of those, right, the biggest predictor all of seem to be life history. Yeah. So is there any real added value to all these exceptionally expensive methods, like for example, all the neuroimaging and all the genetic stuff, and what we're saying is really the biggest predictor of uh, you know, I've, I've, sort of unacceptable behavior in later, later adolescence is going to be just early life history? It's a very, very cheap thing to measure. Yeah, so if, you're, if your goal is just to predict, so if you're a clinician or, or you know, someone else who's in, interested in intervention and you just want to predict them, yeah, I think it is, it probably is the message, is that it's not, it's not worth doing, even those cognitive, even the cognitive tests just weren't, weren't very good. You could just... That's, it's probably the difference between the first thing, the personality measures and the cognitive ones. The cognitive ones were barely able to... You know, and it was a full, uh, like the full waste, or full waste and a full CANTAB battery as well. You know, we did hours of cognitive testing, thanks to them. It wasn't like, you know, there was, a, there was a token short battery we did, like probably three hours of cognitive testing, you know, so yeah. to search through. So I've heard, so Nora Volka, who's the head of NIDA, the, the drug association in the, in the States, uh, I heard her actually of reports that she's mentioned that study as to why they should not fund imaging anymore to look at substance misuse because it just is it's so not predictive. Now, the, the flip side of that is if you want to understand the kind of pathophysiology or the biology of what's going on, that then, then you should study something like the brain because ultimately you're going to find out that there are, there are they're not, they're not very predictive, but they're probably real differences. So, and if you can start to figure out what those differences are, then you can probably maybe get at the biology of, of what's going on in addiction. And that's where it would be useful. So, so part of what I'm trying to do now actually is not use personality measures and, and force, force the classification into using brain measures or biological measures or genetics just to see how well it, it does. So even if it doesn't do well, there's some kind of insight there into the mechanisms. And what would be the, sorry, I'm kind of taking over. No, no, this is good. <laughs> what would be, for example, like the correlation or the overlap between the life history measures and the cognitive and personality measures and brain measures? So, so there is, a, yeah, there's a reasonable amount of overlap, so especially with the personality measures. So there was one measure called the, the TCI, the Trait and Character Inventory, which is slightly obscure. Most people don't know about it, and somehow it ended up in imaging. It is by far the best thing. Like I've used it again and again, even here in UCD, it's by far the best thing. And it correlate, it does correlate with these functional measures. So that the theoretical development of it was that it was based on dopamine. Uh, you know, there's supposed to be some index of dopamine functioning developed like in the 70s before they could actually even test this. And it's abs it, it's really good. Yeah. Really good in what sense? Like it measures. It, it's really predictive. So it's a novelty seeking subscale. So it's got a few different subscales, but basically how likely you are to seek out new experiences and, and so on, uh, and it's really good. So, but it does it does correlate with the brain measures though, mm -hmm. I guess is the point, yeah, it's definitely non-zero correlation. 
and with the life events as well, I can see in that resilience paper that they're not independent. Yeah. You know, you can actually track the two. Okay, and then the other side was that we actually had an external sample as well. The, the model held up in the external sample too. So then we, we just tried rolling this onto nicotine. So people have shown before, plenty of people, that, uh, that adolescent smokers are more likely to be novelty seeking, they have higher rates of temporal discounting, more likely to be uh, sensation seeking. Uh, actually, that's not something that really held up that well in our data. Uh, but then in terms of brain predictors, we were able to take about 1,100 kids who had like either zero, zero to two lifetime cigarettes by age 14. By age 16, most of those are still not smoked. There's actually much smoking in Imogen. Uh, the rates of whatever that cohort effect is, like maybe a quarter of them have ever tried cigarettes. Uh, it's much, much different even a few years before. But they, they tend not to do too much at all, uh, really, which is slightly disappointing for a, a substance misuse study, but the rates have really, really declined a lot. Uh, but there was 178 of them who'd gone on to be daily smokers uh, by the age of 16. So in terms of uh, predicting, if you add in all the brain data and uh, other kind of important covariates like sex and pubertal development, you can do a reasonable prediction on in terms of who's going to be a smoker, so an AUC of 0.64, so much less than the alcohol, and actually now it's it's more kind of global factors that are important, like overall kind of brain maturity. So so you have like a physical maturity index, but then you can also measure the grade to white matter ratio of the brain and kind of come up with some brain maturity uh, metrics. So they tend to be kind of less mature in the brain sense relative to the physical sense. Those who want to be smokers, and there's some. There's some localization in terms of uh, you know, areas that are involved during the angry phases, but in contrast to the alcohol prediction where you could actually, I didn't show the slides there, but you could actually point to some areas that have been replicated that, that show that, you know, that are precursors to people binge drinking, it doesn't seem to be the case uh, for smoking. It seems to be just kind of more global factors. Again, if you just look at personality and, and life history, uh, it's much better than the brain measures and the other kind of physical Measures. Again, th th these are the TCI things here, like novelty seeking, uh, excitability, extroversion. We've got a couple of different measures of that are predictive of whether you're going to go on to smoke. Uh, being conscientious and being agreeable at age 14 I mean, you know, let, are protective of going on uh, to smoke in the future, which is quite interesting. That was something we also found with the binge drinking as well. So that's from the NEO. They're quite, they're quite strong predictors if you're conscientious at 14. Uh, Probably won't smoke or drink at the age of 16. So just kind of more or less to finish up. Uh, so one of the things that I'm interested in now is uh, smoking cessation. So we know there's kind of intriguing evidence that, that former smokers are different to current smokers in terms of their brain function. So you, if a couple of studies have put them into a scanner and given them, given them these tests of inhibitory control. And they outperform controls, so they seem to actually be better than controls at uh, inhibitory control and cognitive control in general. So we don't know if if that's because you know the people who ultimately can remain abstinent from nicotine, which is highly addictive, are just those people who have better uh, control, or if there's some something in the process there of weaning yourself off cigarettes and becoming abstinent that forces you to develop cognitive control. But kind of one of the, the things that got me interested in this was a, a paper. It was actually one of my first cohort of final year students, uh, we got we gave the Iowa gambling task, which is essentially, I'll, I'll ruin it for anybody here, but I guess you're not going to do it, uh, where you've got four decks of cards, two of them are good and two of them are bad. So the, the bad ones actually pay off bigger in the short term, so you get these big rewards, but then every so often you get a catastrophic loss that actually results in a net loss, versus the, the good decks, which pay off very small amounts, but then, you know, over time you're actually go into profit. And the idea is that you, that you should learn to kind of to drift away from the, the bad decks towards the good decks as the task goes on. So most people do that. They tend to, after they get a few catastrophic losses, they tend to switch decks and just accept the, the smaller payoff. So uh, so Martin is also the, the co-first author on this. And so great. So uh, we, we gave this task to, to 25 current smokers, 25 former smokers, and then 25 non-smokers. And what you're seeing along the 
the x-axis here are, are blocks of 20 trials. So we'll just ign ignore the second half of it there. So you can see here that the, the non-smokers, so, so up on the x-axis means basically adjusting to the good blocks, or adjusting to the good decks here. You're, you're veering towards the good decks. So you can see that after you know, two blocks, they're basically the non-smokers have figured out you've got a switch here that you should go toward the good, uh, towards the good decks. Uh, in between are the former smokers, so they kind of get it as well. So you know they're they're slightly slower and they're, they're not as quick to change. But then the the current smokers are very poor. They tend to stick with the the bad deck, so they they're taking the big payoff but getting the big losses over time. So they're they're impulsive in that sense. They have a lack of self control. And then what we did here, these, this is just a variation of the task where you you unbeknownst to the participant, you switch around the, the decks. Then they don't see anything different, but all of a sudden the decks switch. Uh, what we show, what we could show here is that the former smokers were pretty much like controls in terms of adapting to the change contingencies. So they could they could adjust their behavior to take account of the, the differences in the feedback, whereas the non-smokers more or less, or sorry, the current smokers more or less just kept plugging on, uh, selecting the bad decks. So there is there does seem to be something different. We didn't find evidence here that they were better than controls, but there does seem to be something different about former smokers. So that's one of the things I'm trying to figure out now in a longitudinal design is, is what makes these, these people who can wean themselves off cigarettes different to, to those who can't. So is it that they're changing over time? So just a final slide is just ongoing work. So is this prediction of smoking cessation? And it does have a, an elect electrophysiological uh, component. So we're doing it with EEG. And hopefully in time, we're going to get to do it with, with MRI and genetics as well. Uh, also looking at classification of drinking patterns, so to see if there's differences between binge drinkers versus people who drink the same amount of alcohol but not in a binge scenario. So there, again, there's some kind of evidence from the, from the lab here, behaviorally anyway, that they're different. They tend to be more likely to, to be high in sensation seeking and high in, or more disin, or less inhibited, uh, more disinhibited, I guess. So there does seem to be some difference between people who binge drink versus people who, who just drink high amounts regularly. Uh, so in terms of trying to do this neuro prediction, uh, you know, the brain, like we're saying, is not really a very good uh, predictor. It might give us some insight into the pathophysiology, though, uh, ultimately. Uh, and people just need to be cautious in terms of over brain data. So I think in the, in the field in general, people have kind of jumped on board the bandwagon of, in terms of predicting, like, you know, your brain predicts this or... Or that, that you have to be very careful in interpreting uh, data, and then there's, there's ethical issues as well in terms of you know doing a brain scan and saying someone's going to go on and you know develop a, a substance misuse. Or there was a, a paper uh, last year in PNAS that basically looked at recidivism rates in uh, offenders and said, "Oh, look, you can look at the anterior cingulate and predict whether they're going to uh, you know reoffend," but then. So it turns out it was this overfish, so you know they actually just screwed up the data. It was basically just random, uh, but you know the people are quick to latch onto that. And then personality and life events uh, are, are just as good uh, in terms of predictors. So it's something we're also kind of expanding and looking at uh, more nowadays as well. So that's me. Thanks. Now, you know, in two studies there, so your nature paper, you found a uh, rheumatic relation to early sexual mm. activity as a predictor, and then the smoking, you found the strongest predictor was sexual activity, was it? Or it's the same activity? variable, yeah. The same variable, yeah. yeah. So, um, are you going to look at that further, or have you any kind of you know, rationale for why you think that's the case? Mm. Yeah, so it could be this, uh, so we need, need to get into it a bit more, because it was a bit surprising, we didn't expect it, but I, my suspicion or my kind of you know, hypothesis will be that it's this dif difference between your physical maturity and your kind of brain maturity. So the people who are just developing faster, so like basically getting a surge of testosterone uh, earlier on before their brain actually develops to the, to the point where they can have better inhibitory control over that, that it's probably just a proxy for the same thing. That they're, they're, they're more likely to take risks, you know, for the same reason that they're more likely to engage in kind of this early, early sexualized behavior. It's probably just a puberty kind of kicking in uh, mm -hmm. before the brain actually has time to, to catch up with it. Mm -hmm. so, the, so I know the Saguenay study have actually taken like testosterone measurements and stuff, which is not something we do in emission, but that's, you know, there is some kind of preliminary evidence that it's this up, upsurge in testosterone that causes some of these behaviors. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Well, it's just amazing. Thanks so much for going through it. I probably only understood about 10% of it, but leaving that behind. Um, the stuff you showed on canvas there, right? Um, I know it's, you can't say whether it's causing or whatever, but I mean, major deficits mm. that people could be looking at. And I'm interested because in epilepsy, this is coming up as a massive issue now for medicinal purposes. Yeah. And I do mean medicinal, they're not yeah. pulling the pips. And it is it, for other conditions as well. Yeah. Has anybody looked into a sort of minimum dosage effect or, I mean, if, if that's what's heading for people that may be using it medicinally, this major ethical issues here? Or... Yeah, so so I guess the difference with people using it medicinal, like really using it for mm -hmm. glaucoma or multiple sclerosis, the age profile is different. So their, their brain is finished developing, so the, the, the question is really whether taking in cannabis during this kind of key uh, transition period where your brain is still changing it is detrimental. So I don't think anyone's looked at the, the genuine medicine. I presume it's going to be prescribed at age of onset. I don't know if cannabis is available for these. I think that still... For epilepsy and things like that, it would be within the range. Of yeah, I, now they can also they strip out the psychoactive stuff. So I don't know what the... Uh, you know what the active ingredient is. I know like for MS, it's probably some of the similar ingredients. You know, the, the endocannabinoid system, mm -hmm. the kind of pain relief. Mm -hmm. But if it's for epilepsy, the active, you know, there's like a thousand different yeah, yeah. chemicals in in uh, cannabis that it, you know, and some of them for medicinal purposes, they can strip away the psychoactive ones, so you basically just get the, the other effects. Uh, so I don't know. So, yeah, I don't think. So I know Sir Robin Murray in the, in the UK and the IOP is very, uh, you know, uh, quick to say that this is causal, mm -hmm. that basically schizophrenia is being caused by people who are uh, taking on uh, cannabis as teenagers. You know, skunk. So basically mm -hmm. skunk is 40 times more powerful than cannabis was a generation ago. So you've got all these people taking in uh, skunk, which is basically concentrated, and high rates of uh, psych you know, psychotic behavior as well. So. So I'd, I'd be really surprised if they prescribed it medicinally. Mm -hmm. I would think that would be a, a big jump. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think neuroscience is, is losing the battle of actually conveying how long neurological adolescence um, lasts? Because I mean, the, the general picture of adolescence is, you know, parents who feel they were doing well if they could have gone up till 16 or 18 for alcohol. And, yeah. The idea, though, that the brain is vulnerable when into the twenties, yes, and what you're saying, um, speaks to a whole new level of trying to get awareness across to young adults at, in the early stages of independence, independent adult life. Yeah, absolutely. Because so we know, like, that the brain doesn't stop developing until about the age of twenty-five. Like, so, so all the all these undergrads here, they still have, you know, brains that are very susceptible to binge drinking and so on. So you can kind of compare a little bit with like in the states the, the drinking age in Canada is 19 versus 21, you know. And of course, a lot of them, like where I was in Vermont, they substitute alcohol with cannabis, so it's very hard to disentangle. But people have compared the two cohorts of you know uh, an onset of drinking at 21 versus 19, and there are differences there. That like the later, even the two year later start is beneficial in terms of brain function. Although you're just pointing out, you know that. They so roughly half of fourteen year olds here are drinking and they're drinking age is eighteen, so the actual legal age yeah. they can have that much. It's sixteen in Germany. Yeah. yeah. So it's so as well. Okay. So I was amazed well, I was delighted to see. Yeah. There's so you're you're almost regretting that you can't get enough younger smokers. But it was, yeah. That's six I so mean, society things yeah. don't work. Yeah, it is totally That's dropping true. off. Yeah. And even like yeah. those guys who smoke, they're not it was so sixty heavy smokers out of two and a half thousand. Mm -hmm. You know, like ten really. years ago that would be yeah, yeah. so it would have been 50%, yeah. Now it's 25% sure. to even try the cigarette. And even drinking, all that kind of stuff, they're, like they're, now it's kind of slightly cut by the fact that people who don't come back for the follow-up assessment are those ones who you yeah. really want because they're off like getting drunk. And they're not, <laughs> or they're, they're, they're stoked. You know, but, but, you know, the ones who are coming back are remarkably clean. There's almost nothing, uh, you know, in there in terms of like chronic addiction or anything at this rate. How honest do you think they are? Yeah, so, so it's all anonymized for a start, uh, and there are other catch things as well in there, so there's, there's a variety of different metrics. So if, not for the baseline, but for subsequent ones, they did a face-to-face a -face timeline, timeline follow-back interview, so you actually ask them specifically, you know, like last Saturday or last week, think, so you work back, you, got a, you get a calendar out, and you work back, 
So, you, so if you ask them, like, you know, how much did you smoke or drink in the last month, they'll give you one measure. But if you work back day by day, like, so they seem to be. But there are uh, we do have catch things in there as well. So we have fake drugs that they that you know. Mm -hmm. Five percent of them will endorse the fake drug that they've taken. You know things like this. You can catch them because you, you ask the same question a few different ways. And you can spot the discrepancies. And you know, I found like ten percent of the sample are, are clean at, at age sixteen, but said that they were doing loads at age fourteen. You know, so clearly they're lying one way or the other. And you just yeah. take them out then? Yeah, you just get rid of them. Yeah, but they do tend to lie like uh, a lot. Uh, and then actually, the, the software for doing the assessments is very very good. It, it logs keystrokes and things like this. So if there's like a an inordinate delay between keystrokes, you know, it would flag them up as, as something that's happened. So like they're listening to music or doing something else, or mm -hmm. someone's come into the room, you know. So it's actually always monitoring what they're up to. Uh, but yeah, I think they're well, we, on, on a different too. issue. Your stats are amazing. The the stats that you right. you kind of found elsewhere yeah. and brought in. Do you think the the P less than 0.05, is that how today? Yeah, I think so, I think yeah. it's long outdated. I think it is, yeah. So I, actually, yesterday I read the American Statistical Association position paper. Like, it's not actually, I printed it out, actually. It's like two pages long or something. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it, I think, yeah, I think it's gone. Yeah, I wouldn't ever use it again. I use these reproducibility uh, metrics, so the uh, cross-validation or even bootstrapping, things like this, uh, much more accurate. I wonder what's going to happen with undergrads, like we've been so used to your T-tests and your foundations and that's so advanced, you know. Well, it's certainly... You don't so, know so, what to be teaching undergrads anymore. Yeah. Well, the, re the reason that the, the journals like PLS 105 uh, is because that's what everybody knows and the reason that everybody knows it is because when we're undergrads, all the journals are PLS 105, so mm. it's totally circular. Like, at some point you've got to break and say, you know... Yeah, but then uh, that doesn't always play. We recently submitted a paper to one to psychological science. They were they were asking for the new statistics. They had an yeah. editorial comment asking for it, so we painstakingly wrote out our paper with a single p value, and the reviewer sent it back asking for p values. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's very it's a very hard habit. I mean, I guess there's nothing wrong with p values in general. Just it's one snapshot of, of one way of looking at it. Uh, but I think a lot yeah. of papers probably get booted out if they don't have a statistically significant difference. And you think. But there's loads of information here. There's there's yeah. loads of findings here, but it's the usual kind of you know, it's not statistically significant. Yeah. There's some massive bias and complications for that. You just go straight to that in you know, I think mean, a lot of reviewers they just want to see was it did it make the magic yeah, statistically exactly, significant. Yeah. You know, but you miss all the nuance and everything else that happens. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. yours seems to have that much more holistic view of yeah. the data set. Well, what I do find that is that it's brutally honest. If you really have nothing in your data, it'll tell you there's nothing there. It'll just come back at zero. And did you go and you mentioned some papers earlier that were underpowered? Do those yeah. they've been published? Yes, yeah, so they're all they're all there. published in like archives of psychiatry and you know. And have you named? A yeah, we were forced to name a chain. <laughs> there you, I didn't want. And did you get any feedback? From I, the paper itself has actually like in just in the last six months picked up a lot of, a bit of traction. So I've heard people talking about it like but. People are starting to, to know it's starting to get cited quite a bit more now. No one's actually come up and so I know I've actually co authored with people who we name chained. <laughs> I think they, I don't, they don't really care. They got their archives paper, remember? Like, oh, yeah. right, fair you're enough. Not, you're also not, you're also not, not saying they were dishonest, you're saying they were using methods that are now outdated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's not like it was disease deliberate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And no, no one knew about it. Like, I, the only reason I found out is because my result was 100% predictive. And I still took about two days to realise, geez, that's way too good. <laughs> and, then, and then I kind of just coincidentally came across this other thing at the same time. So, so uh, yeah. thanks very much. Thank